And I just hope I remember to stop it at the end. <laughs> OK, so today's programme, I'm going to be telling you about WDF, the Workforce Development Fund. Kieran Morris is going to be telling you and explaining the benefits of the ASC WDS, um, the Adult Social Care Workforce data set. Richard Francis is here, he's going to be talking about apprentices. Uh, we've got Proud Care with us, who's going to tell you all of you some hips and tips about recruitment, which is all really useful. And Isabel's on to tell us all about the Bristol Dementia Hit. Okay, so I'm going to start by, as I say, I'm, I'm going to tell you about the Workforce Development Fund. It's something that uh, I manage for Care and Support Wear. So I'm going to share my screen a moment. And we're just going to Kieran, can you see that? Yeah, hopefully somebody can oh, see yeah. that. Yeah, okay, brilliant. Okay. So the Workforce Development Fund. Have you heard about it before? Hopefully some of you may have done and some of you may have already claimed from it. Basically, the Workforce Development Fund is a pot of money that the government has made available and dispersed through Skills for Care um, to help social care providers help their staff gain qualifications, training. There's a whole range of qualifications that you can apply for. And it's... Um, a fund that's paid retrospectively. That means to say you've got to have completed the programme or the candidate has to complete the programme. But you can claim up to £2,000 in any one year for per candidate. That's not per employer or per, per company. That's per employer. So um, it's really, really worth having. It's... Um, it covers accredited courses, it covers non-accredited courses, apprenticeships, learning programmes, uh, digital learning programmes. There's a whole wealth of uh, programmes that you can, your staff can apply for, can um, sit, gain the qualification, and then you can actually um, claim the money back. So anybody coming on, could you please make sure you are mute? Thank you. The Workforce Development Fund runs annually and um, we are still waiting for the government to give us or inform us how much money this year they're going to allocate. Um, but we're all ready to go. And um, once we get the nod from the government, we can actually start making claims. Care and Support West are now in the fourth year. We're going into our fourth year of, of supporting the partnership. And um, starting from no partners at all, we've now got over 100 organisations who benefit from claiming from this. It's a very easy um, action to, to do. And um, last year, we had over 50,000 of money distributed to all our partners. It's a fantastic sum of money. So what do you have to do to claim from the WDF? You have to complete a, create an account, which is an adult social care workforce data set account, which Kieran Morris is going to tell you all about later on. You're going to have to register with Care and Support West WDF partnership. It's a completely free registration. You don't have to be a member. I'll emphasize you don't have to be a member of Care and Support West. We'd like you to be, obviously, but you don't have to be. Um, you populate your ASC WDS um, with your workforce information and you can go through the um, qualifications to see what you can apply for. Let me just give you a very quick example. A level five, you could claim £1,500. A level three, you could claim £800. That's just a, a very tip of the iceberg. There's loads of courses, lots of lots and lots of useful information on the on the these are links and um when you when you you, you can get I, I can send these out to everybody if you if you wish to know anybody who wants to know this information please ask 
put your name, your information into the chat and I will send you, you send it to me privately, I will send you the information. So once you've registered, um, you complete the qualification and then you've got the certificate in your hand and then you send the certificate to me and I do all the work for you. Uh, these are just a few things that you need for the, for the uh, claims. You need the employer certificate, the qualification number, but as I say, I do all the work for you. There's a few dates to remind, just to be reminded of. The year, anything runs from the 1st of January 22. So any certificate you have from the 1st of January 22 until the 31st of March 23 is you can qualify for. Um, you have to be registered with the WDF partnership by the 28th of February. And your Ask WDF needs to be updated by the 31st of March 23. 20, 31st of March 23 is the last claiming date for the year 22-23. Just a few dates to, to be reminded. But once you're, once you're engaged with me, I will keep you informed with all of that. And that's my details. So that's, that's a whistle-stop tour about the WDF. And I'm going to stop sharing. That's, as I say, it's a very, very quick whistle-stop tour. Um, but if you want to know more information, please drop me a line and we will, um, uh, I can tell you more about it. Now, I'm going to hand over to Karen Morris, who's going to tell you a little bit about the, um, Karen, I'm going to make you a, <laughs> I have to make you a host and let's find you a moment. There you go, there you go. Okay. So Karen, can I hand you over? Do you want me to do your size or are you going to do your size? Yes, I can do. I'm still disabled at the moment, aren't they? No, you should be. Let's try again. Yeah. Ah, yeah, we're up now. Excellent. Well, hi everybody. It's good to see so many of you. And um as as Kieran says, you know, this money is, is available to you and it's so important at the moment that we look at retention um, and part of retention is through development. Oh, I think I've frozen. Ah. Have you? Have yeah. I frozen? I've... Started, share, started sharing. Brilliant, okay. I think I think my video's frozen, but my, my voice is obviously still going, which is great. That's amazing. Shall I share your screen, Karen? No, you stop. I'm good. I'm up. All right. Yeah. Okay. I'll just get it up as a slideshow now. Okay. Can we see? Yes. Great. So this session is really about the adult social care workforce data set, or you might have heard, heard it known as the abbreviation ASK WDS. Or, or some of you, if you've been around as long as me, will remember it as the NMDS, which was the National Minimum Data Set. So over the next 15 minutes, I'm just going to look at some of the benefits to you for registering on this system. And then I'll go on and provide a live demo so that you can see how, how, the, how the data works in the system and how to upload it. Um, so it's really important to say that in order to claim that workforce development funding that Karen was talking about, you do need to be registered and up to date on this system to be able to claim. So the Adult Social Care Workforce Data Set is an online data service and the leading source of workforce information for the adult social care sector in England. So Skills for Care are commissioned by the Department of Health and Social Care to provide the data service and we're all really keen to increase the coverage of the data so that we can account for the whole of the social care um, workforce basically. So to give you an idea of the type of data that is collected I'm going to start off with a couple of quiz style questions just around the adult social care workforce. So in 2021 how many registered managers do you think left their roles just in the NSSG? I'm quite happy for you just to shout out what you think or pop it in the chat. So is it 150, 300 or 450? How many managers do we think left their roles just in BNSSG? People are saying B. Don't A. Some A. Okay. 
Anybody saying C? No. No. Okay. Um, there you go. Well, it is C. It's 450, which is quite staggering, really, considering that in BNSSG and Baines, actually, collectively, there are approximately 519 CQC care providing locations. So that means that roughly the same amount of managers, you know, are leaving. So we're in a really precarious position. And that sort of data tells us, you know, how much we need to be sort of workforce planning and especially succession planning for our next registered managers. So here's another one. What percentage of the adult social care workforce hold a qualification? And this is your kind of level two, level three, fours and five diplomas. So again, this is for BNSSG. What percentage of the workforce hold a qualification? 72%, 24% or 49%. C's coming through. B. C. C. 49%. Oh, there's a B there, but mostly C's. Yeah, okay. So again, we're not we're not thinking that we're better than what we are, really. But yeah, no, it's it's actually C is 49%, which is less than half of the workforce. Um, and actually the NSSG is the second lowest for qualifications in the Southwest, highest um, at 59%. So you can see again from this data that's provided in the RSWDS. It's crucial information that really does provide key decision makers such as and Department of Health and Social Care and CQC, as well as local authorities, it, it provides them with that data that, that you know, they, can, they can actually plan for the workforce, as well as helping providers to manage their teams. So there is a short video, which because I'm on Zoom, I probably am not gonna be able to play it. I'll give it a go. Health social care workforce. Are we able to hear that? Yes, Joe. Oh, good. Data set for online service that keeps you connected and make sure your voice is heard by the government. Well, it's intermittent. Decision makers. By using this online service, you can track all your staff information. No, it's no good, Karen. It's, it's information, including their training and qualification. Okay, that's fine. I can um, briefly talk through it then. Just sort of we're breaking this into my voice really especially as it's quite croaky um it's going to take me through the whole video now and not the slides <laughs> oh, mess. no it's not having it won't move There we go. Okay, so just, um, just, just a kind of whirlwind um, introduction to it then. So first of all, the purpose of providing the data, one of the main reasons is that the adult social care faces so many challenges, but with the data that you're giving us, we're able to provide the government and policymakers with a true picture of the sector and highlight the areas that really need the most support. So by using the data set, it means that all care providers can actually make their voice heard. Here's an example of how the data is pre presented, and it's done in really easy ways to interpret. So th this data is available nationally, regionally, and locally, and this is just a snapshot of the Southwest. So it shows how many jobs there are in the adult social care sector, as well as how many vacancies there are um, currently in the sector. So you can then drill that down into your local areas. So this is Baines. Um, can't quite see the top of it, the slide, but it's, it'll say Baines at the top. And I filtered this because in this purple bar here, you're able to select um, different service groups. So you could put in um, local authority care, you can put in, in domiciliary care, you can put in residential care. And then you can also filter the job roles. So for this slide, I put in the registered nurses because I thought it would be interesting to look at the turnover rate for registered nurses. 
So you can see from 63.4% 63 or 75 le levers, that is pretty high to be losing registered nurses and social care. Um, and um, it's not the highest in the Southwest. Um, I'm just, I think it's Bristol actually, that's the highest, 73%. But if you wanted to compare that with other local authorities in the Southwest, you can also go in and, and check where, where you stand as Baines um, or, or BNSSG, so, or your individual local authorities. So you can see from there, um, that's the various different registered nurse turnover rates in So all of these reports are available on the Skills for Care website under the Workforce Intelligence tab, and, and, and they're created and packed for everyone to use. So all of that information really helps CQC and the decision makers, um, the workforce planning. And um, I just wanted to let you know that, that the data, you, you, are, you actually can give consent yourself. So if you can choose to give the data to CQC, and you can also choose to the local authority you get the option again to do that as, as a GDPR um, consent when you actually register on the site so that's really up to you it also doesn't give um, completely identifiable information about your staff we don't ask for addresses we don't ask for postcodes and we don't ask for national insurance numbers it li literally is just the date of birth because that way um, we're able to measure the age range of workers, which is really important to know for retirement ages, etc. So just to finish off, um, what are the benefits for you having an adult social care worker? Well, first of all, you can gain the funding for your training workforce development fund, as well as in the free rapid induction and essential training fund. The Workforce Development Fund allows you to claim back money towards the costs of the workers completing a wide range of social care qualifications. We've got lots of accredited, so you've got your diplomas, um, awards and certificates, which are all lifelong qualifications, as well as the range of learning programmes and digital modules that, that Skills for Care provide as well through our endorsed providers. So um, you, can, you could fund, for example, a level two certificate in dementia for 300 pound, or like Kieran says, you can get a level five diploma at 1500 pound. We also provide a backfill for apprenticeships. Um, if they complete the whole framework, including the endpoint assessment, um, you can also draw down additional funding for that on top of the um, levy funding or any other funding that you can access. It's not double funded. The rapid induction training, um, this is particularly for new entrants into care and it, and it came into force at the start of the pandemic in order for, your, for you to get your staff trained really quickly. Um, so we offer the full care certificate with lots of the mandatory training through our endorsed providers and you can access all that free of charge um, and that, that funding's actually just been extended now, so it is available already. Um, the system also provides you safe and free storage of your staff records and can help you to manage your training. So you, you don't have to use that system, but it's available for you. So you can input all your training records and the system will alert you to when that training's expiring or when somebody's coming out of date for their training. You can benchmark your workplace against other providers in the area. So for metrics like pay, um, sickness, um, or turnover rates, you can compare yourself to the 70 other residential homes in the area, for example. And then you can also get Skills for Care bundle offers. We've got lots of discounts on various services and products and including some of the training that's offered through our endorsed providers. So to set up an account, you can create an account really easily with just a few basic details and your work play on your work. And that's all you need to do in order to access the training. But once your details have been checked and approved, you can then start to add your work. Record. Um, we've got a help desk that's available nine to five. Friday as well as a 
telephone service if you can accept with any of it. But myself and Kieran will absolutely help you any step of the way as well on top of that. So that's that's in a nutshell, that is the system. But before I go on to, to show you the demo, I just wondered if there's any questions at all around any of that. There's nothing on the chat. I've got, I've got a question with regard to CQC, Kieran. I don't know. Um, what's the advantage of sharing your SWDF with the CQC? They will, they can use it to look at your training records. So, and you can also use it to submit information prior to inspection for training records as well. And obviously um, they can access all the data that you're putting about turnover rates, payment, um, okay. anything they need to know really, it's on the data system. Good. So it is, there is a benefit to it, which is good. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. If there's no questions, then I'll just go in and do, am I right for time? Yeah, five minutes. Five minutes, just a really, really quick demo of the system. And I'm hoping I can get this up because I need to go through Google. There might be a bit of a delay. No, it's come through. Oh, that's good. I should start at the home page, really. That'll be easier, won't it? That's fine. I can sign in. <clears throat> this is exactly what you'll do. You'll be given a login. Um, and, and I suggest that you have um, a couple of people added to the account because obviously if one of you one of leaves, the other one won't be able to access it or, or you know, staff won't be able to access it. So if I go to the home page, first of all, it will show you that the types of benefits bundles that you get from registering on the system. So lots of discounts from various different training providers, um, so, you know, um, some of the skills for care courses as well, and our e-learning modules. Some of those are really worth doing it. In fact, NAPA have got a 50% um, off their activity courses at the moment, which is a really effective bundle. This is, the, this is what you'll need to do to make sure that you're eligible for your WDF to claim the funding, because obviously this system needs to be up to date for you to be able to claim. So what you'll hopefully get is a tick like that to say that your debt data has met the WDF 22, 23 requirements. So you'll, you'll know that you'll be able to claim if it's across, literally go through and pinpoint what areas you need to update. And, and usually it's as simple as somebody hasn't got a date of birth or you might not have put um, something about the workplace in there. So it's usually quite straightforward. And then if you want to, if you're using the system for the first time and you've got lots of staff over 60, over 60 in numbers, not in age, <laughs> Um, you can actually bulk upload that data so that you're not doing it one by one. So it makes it a lot quicker. So the first bit of data that you'll need to put in is about your workplace. Obviously, this is a fictitious workplace. Um, it's 20 beds. Your serv the service there, the main service, you my mind's care home is nursing services, but it could be that your dom care. So if it is dom care, it'll ask you how many hours and not how many beds and then um, any vacancies, the new starters that you've had and any levers. Then your individual records. So very small home, I've only got seven members of staff. So when you go to input this data, the best time to do it is really when this person starts work with you, because it's, you know, if you're doing all the recruitment stuff, it makes sense to have this open in the background and you can add, to the, this data set as you go. So what, what we're asking for, um, you can put in the flu vaccination, because it's really good for government to know how many vaccinations, how many health and social care staff have had the flu jab. You can see you don't need to put national insurance number. We do need the date of birth, but we don't need the postcode. And um, basically go through the metrics and then um, the date they started, how how much sickness they've had in 12 months, 
and what kind of contract they've got, hourly pay, whether they've completed qualifications. And for, for the purpose of the data set, you only need to put their accredited qualifications, so your diplomas. We don't need you to put in all of their training in order to claim the Workforce Development Fund. That's just for your own interest. So that gives you an idea of um, staff record. So for the training and qualifications, this tells me that um, there are, there's one record that's expired and one record that's due to expire. And all of these courses, you can just self-populate this. It's not, it's not preset. So whatever courses that your organization does, you can put in here. So you can see that um, the fire safety expired in April. So it's very simple just to update that. Um, and then the equality, it's warning me that equality and diversity is, is due to expire in September. Now there is a, um, there's also a um, Excel, if I go back, I can show you. So you can also download the training report. So that will download in an Excel document with all the staff listed, all the training, what's due to expire, um, or what's expired, so you can access that really simply. And I won't show you because it'll throw me out of the system if I download that. And then finally, it's the benchmark. So this is where we can give you a comparison group of organisations in your area. And you can see that there's, this has been measured across 70, 73 staff from 11 workplaces providing the same main service as me in the same local authority. So <clears throat> you can see from this that the pay I've got for my workplace is £9.50, but the other 73 staff are on £9.52. <clears throat> so you can see from that that I probably need to um, give my staff a pay rise. What is good is the, the sickness level. So in my workplace, the average worker was off six days in the last 12 months, whereas it's 10 in the other areas. So that tells me I'm getting something right with my staff sickness. I couldn't, I haven't had the turnover rates yet because I haven't put enough data in to be able to reach that. Um, but again, you can see that qualifications are pretty low in my workplace compared to 90% in other groups. And that's staff that have got a level two. So for my workforce planning, I know that I need, first of all, to put my pay up and then um, look, at, look at offering more qualifications within the workplace. So that is the system in a nutshell. And I can see, you know, it, it might be that you're thinking, oh my goodness, that's a lot of data to put in, um, you know, that's going to take forever. And I'm not going to lie and say, no, it's really easy. It, it is quite a laborious process to start with. You know, it is going to take time. But please use your administration staff for that. You know, don't do it yourself as managers. Um, and even, you know, apprentices. Get a business admin apprentice if you can. <laughs> it's a really good job for them to do. But once the data's in, you know, like, like your email system, have it open in the background and you can add to it as you go every day or your administration staff can. Thank you, Karen. There is one question um, from Lee asking if you can add multiple workplaces um, CQC locations under yes, one account can. yes you can I'm not quite sure how you do that without going back in to show you but um, certainly Lee if you if you send that to the um, support service email they'll guide you through that but yeah it is possible to do that okay thank you thank you very much um, if there's no more questions we'll be moving swiftly on to Richard. Um, thank you for that, Kieran. It's quite useful because it, it is a little bit of a minefield, isn't it, with the actual what does it contain and where is you know why do I need to do it? But obviously there are benefits for it. But uh, anyway, yeah. I'd like to introduce you now to Richard, Richard Francis, it's, uh, who's going to talk about apprentices. Thank you, Richard. You are you are if you've got any slides, if you want to share, are you just going to talk to us? Perfect. Uh, morning, everybody. So I'm Rich Francis. I'm the Apprenticeship Project Manager for BNSSG. So I'm just going to talk to you a bit about apprenticeships. I do have some slides. However, I'm not 
that familiar with Zoom, but I'll try, I assume I just share a screen and select my slide deck. Let's try this and see, let me know if you can see it. Yeah, we can see it. Perfect. Right. So I'm just going to talk to you a bit about apprenticeships. And interesting that I follow on from, from Karen's presentation about 450 registered managers leaving, you know, 49% of staff holding a qualification, because what, what that tells me is, is you could do an apprenticeship at level fours and fives, which would give you that registered manager status, but actually 51% of our staff wouldn't be eligible to enroll onto those apprenticeships due to not having a lower level qualification, because partly eligibility to do this, you have to hold a level three to be able to do a level five qualification. So that's quite interesting. And, and the fact that there's so many levers, 73% uh, of levers, and, and there's a whole host of work that we're doing across the NSG to support nursing staff to get qualification, which I'll run through in a second. But first of all, I just want to give you a bit of an overview about apprenticeships and understanding them and, and what is an apprenticeship. I'm not going to read these slides word for word. Uh, what I will do is share the slides with Karen so she can send them out with, with any meeting packets, etc. Or if you've got any questions, then obviously I'll send my email and that to be shared. But essentially, what is an apprenticeship? So it, it allows somebody to enter a trade uh, with no previous qualifications. So, for example, you know, business administration, nursing, care worker. Uh, what we do have to do is make sure that we obviously support that person to get that qualification. Um, we, we have to allow them things like off-the-job training. You know, we have to bear in mind if they've got no previous skills or, or behaviours within that line of work, you know, they are starting from scratch. But on top of that, we can also use it to support existing members of staff. So, for example, if you've got somebody who might have done a level three qualification, you know, is that person maybe suitable to become a registered man manager in the future? Could we upskill that person to do the level five apprenticeship? So, so when they complete that, you know, they could then become a registered manager. Interestingly, there is some myths uh, around apprenticeships. You know, a lot of people automatically assume they are for young people, uh, and and that that that's not true. So, anybody any age from sixteen or over can do an apprenticeship to right up to retirement age. As well as the apprenticeship itself, so as well as learning the core requirements of the qualification, you know, they they will also so the apprentice will complete English and maths alongside that. They'll also do things like CV writing with a training provider. They'll also do things like interview skills as well. So there are many benefits to apprenticeships. So uh, the, if, if you Google the benefits to apprenticeships, you know, there's many on there about things like retention of the workforce. You know, many employers have seen higher product productivity from their workforce. When they offer apprenticeship, many have seen improvements on staff retention. Also as well, it creates the opportunity to grow your own workforce. Um, so what we need to think about as well as the lower level apprenticeships is think about the higher ones as well. So, for example, you know, I'll give you an example in the BMSSG, you know, we, we have trainee nurse associates that were leaving various organisations because they didn't register, the reg uh, they didn't offer the registered nurse degree apprenticeship programme as, as a progression route. So those organisations have looked at that and they're now offering that apprenticeship as well. So it, it can be used as a retention tool. Um, an apprenticeship is a job as well, so it's important that the person is paid. Uh, an apprenticeship is an employer-led training program, so the, the training that the apprentice receives is very much led by yourselves. There is a national standard that we must uh, follow on the Institute for Apprenticeships, but the, the actual training of how to do the job is delivered by the employer. Uh, like I said, it also creates many transferable skills. Uh, it offers career progression. Um, but there's many benefits to an apprenticeship and, and also as well, if it's a young apprentice so under the age of 18, you know, you can receive various grants on top of the WDF funding, you can receive grants from the government that support young people developing as well. So understanding the funding. So the funding is, is an interesting area. So if you've got a pay bill as an organisation of more than £3 million pounds a year, uh, you will be a levy paying organisation, uh, which is 0.05% of your pay bill goes towards an apprenticeship levy, you then use that to cover the tuition costs. Uh, as, as with most BNSSG care organisations, you're, you're a non-levy paying organisation, so on, on that front you'll be asked to pay 5% of the cost of the qualification from the training provider and then the government pay the other 95%. However, something I do want to talk to you about is today is in, in the BNSSG, and I know BSW do do the same thing as well. We do have a levy transfer system. So what that means is uh, a large employer in your patch, so for example, NBT, do support smaller organisations with levy transfer. So what that means is, is if you wanted to do a £5,000 qualification, instead of you being invoiced to 5% of the cost of the qualification, organisations such as NBT or UHBW will transfer the whole cost of the qualification to the training provider so you don't have to pay that. 
Uh, and then you can claim the WDF to obviously support things with backfill. Um, there is an application process that the money is running out slightly in the BNSSG, but we do have a lot of apprentices due to finish. Um, there is a, a requirement that if we do levy transfer apprentices, we do ask if you can support with placements in return. Uh, so, for example, what we've got is we've got training nurse associates that don't necessarily have a work placement. So you need to support. We need employers to support them for six weeks placements at a time. Uh, so what we do is we ask for a return on that investment if you can support the replacement. Um, interestingly, you know, we've had a lot of GP practices and, and some care homes actually apply for the non-care qualification lately, which is things like business admin. So it's interesting. I know in the BNSSG that's been identified recently as a recruitment hotspot for us is those administration roles. So again, if we've got the time to support people, you know, and, and with apprentices, local people normally apply for those apprenticeship roles. So it's about giving people those opportunities for the communities that we serve as well. Right in the in the BNSSG, those that submit their apprenticeship figures to us, you know, we've we've got just over 840 apprentices at the moment in, in the main acute and Serena and AWB. And some of the other social care organizations do submit their apprenticeship data to us as well. So the numbers are growing every every month on, on apprentices. So again, I'm not going to go through these slides word for it, but I'm happy for them to share it's a bit more information in there about what is a levy transfer, who can the money be transferred to, how much can be transferred, etc. So there is a big requirement in, in, as in off the job training with apprentices. Uh, it was previously, I don't think I've got it in this slide anymore, 20%. So it was previously 20% off the job training. But it's now changed from, well, it's changing from August. So it'd be six hours a week is, is off the job training moving forward. And what that means is it doesn't mean that we lose the member of staff for six hours a week, but it means that we must prove that we've trained them for six hours a week. So if you have got someone that's new to, new to your organization, and they're doing all their care certificate or their mandate, mandatory training, such as fire training, all that counts as off the job training, which is how we document that. So it doesn't mean that we lose the number of staff for six hours a week. It means that we have to prove that we keep, but the training provider you select will obviously have a system in place to capture that training. And every time the apprentice meets their trainer, they'll, they'll be discussing what training they've done this month. And it all should be captured on the systems that they use. Um, off the job training, it's really important to capture the off the job training because an apprentice can't go forward to the endpoint assessment until the off the job training requirement has been met. So what happens is, is there'll be a tally of hours and, and when that's reached, you know, in 12 months time, if it's a level two program, they'll then tally up the hours to make sure the, you know, the six hours of the off job training element have been met and then they'll go forward to the EPA. So I've got here just some list of things of what can and be included in the off the job training, as you can see, it's things that we do all the time. You know, back when I was working in industry with apprentice, you know, I was a chef. So if I taught somebody to say how to make brown bread and I spent four hours doing that, that is simply what I would capture on that off the job training record. And, and as you can see, you know, we, we all train our staff, so it, it shouldn't be a barrier to 20% off the job training. Um, but there's, there's a big list of things there that can be included. Like I said, e-modules, you know, if you're shadowing somebody, you know, reflective learning, sometimes they get different service improvement projects that you might ask them to do. So again, all that can be counted as off the job training. Uh, interesting as well, I've, I've got questions a bit there, but I've also got some other bits to come. So I know if you are managing, say, a, a nursing home and you have registered nurses and nursing associates as a role, I know sometimes you might sit there and think, well, nursing associates and registered nurses, they require all and sundry placements to get them through the apprenticeship. How will I be able to get access to those placements? Anyway, as, as, a, as an integrated care system, we've actually got facilities in place to support those placement discussions. So on the trainee nurse associate program, we have two people employed in post who rotate those placements. So as long as you as an organization, if you were to think, actually, I would like to employ a trainee nurse associate, you know, as long as you take a, a student in return, when your student goes out on placement, we can support with that placement swapping and we have access to all the care providers across the NSSG that, that have tapped into that system. We're also creating a similar thing for the registered nurse degree apprenticeship as well, which is the next level up. Um, we're not quite there on that one yet, but we, we have created a registered nurse community of practice group and they're having that discussion on placements and who requires them and how they're going to support each other. Um, so there's all sorts, so, so as well as, you know, the benefits of apprenticeship, you know, we can support with levy transfer and we can also support your placements as well. Um, and we can also support with things like, so some training providers, for example, might charge for a resit on endpoint assessment. We can also 
worked with the training provider to eliminate those charges for resits um, as, as long as we use one that we're already using type thing, which are all on the skills for care indoor training provider website anyway. Um, you, Richard. Sorry, I do talk really quick, but that's the end of mine. You know, if you've got any questions, I'll welcome them. Thank you, Richard. That was, that's a whistle stop tour. And I know that there's so much information more that you could uh, depart. So short of time, I'm afraid. But uh, I'm sure people, if you've got questions, please go to Karen's got her hand up. Um, You're on I, sorry, I just think it'd be really useful if, if we could pop in the chat the, the contacts. So if I'm a provider and I'm thinking, yeah, actually, I would like to train some of my existing staff. Who, who do you go to? Where do we start with that? Because I'm not sure if providers will know that. So I don't know if we can put emails in the chat or contacts. So predominantly at the moment within the within the Learning Academy group, anything apprenticeship would, would be myself. So I could pop my email in the chat if Brilliant. you want, and then, and then I can direct you from there. Brilliant. I didn't well know you have minimums doing that for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, it's, it's interesting that I led on from your bit there, Karen, about the 450 yeah. pages of managers leaving, et cetera. You know, to me, that says we've got to do something, otherwise we could just gonna end up in a Absolutely. That's you. lovely. Thank you very much, Richard. I really appreciate your time this morning. And um, we can now lead on quite happily to um, Kirsty. I think you're ready. Yeah. Okay. I, you're, I am. You're, yes. Okay. So you're going to tell us about recruitment. Um, so again, it's sort of keeping within the. <laughs> so brilliant. We can see your screen. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. I, I, thanks for having me, everyone. And I know we're, we're running out of time now. And I really want to spend um, most of my slot just listening. So I'm just going to skip through. Uh, the Proud Care campaign, just what it's about, and uh, uh, some material should have been shared with you, and I'd be really interested in your feedback. So that's the main purpose of today. So just in terms of uh, what's Proud to Care, um, let's see if I can, oh no, how do I go down? Don't know how to, no. ha, right, okay, it's worked. Um, so it's a recruitment campaign. It was really inspired by uh, Devon. Uh, Devon started the Proud to Care recruitment campaign. Historically, um, it's had sort of a pretty small budget and small, you know, people working, sort of juggling it amongst other responsibilities. Um, and it's focused on a kind of a websites, council-led websites which consolidate vacancies and some local recruitment events. Um, but in October 2021, 20, uh, the Healthier Together of BNSSG. Um, injected some investment and that's meant that we can do more so we've launched a campaign over the winter period I, don't, I, I hope people saw some of that uh, we commissioned some market research which again hopefully has been shared with you and we're sort of about to launch our second campaign our, 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 the second phase of our campaign uh, so very briefly the kind of what's different about the campaign we launched um, in the winter was we really wanted to um, introduce a much more targeted approach and marketing speak that's segmentation so we have we have three sets of people fairly broad groups that we're wanting to um, uh, target young people people returning to work maybe after they've had a, had children or had a career break and then people looking to do something um, more meaningful maybe later in life um, because it was a digital campaign we were able to measure the impact um, to a certain extent we're still quite, quite limited but we know that 85,000 people saw the Facebook ads, we know how many people came to the landing page we created, we know that actually the landing page content was pretty effective, so 50% of people actually were interested in clicking on the jobs websites. Um, what we're less um, able to do is actually then track that through to how that might translate into people being recruited, because obviously that's um, completely dispersed and that's that lies with you, and also the, the different Proud to Care websites that we run are all on different systems. So as you can see at the bottom there, the kind of statistics we have are kind of a little bit all over the place. Um, this is just a useful slide just to show you how you have to pay for pay for eyeballs, basically. So you can see where we've paid uh, for recruitment ads to be seen. And then the minute we stop paying for the ads, the kind of the attention drops off. Um, bottom left, we can also see that when we do a video ad, that's much more effective as well. So it's kind of more engaging, more sticky, um, again, to use a bit of jargon. Um, so that's, we fed that into our next campaign. Um, we did some really interesting market research and I'm not gonna um, begin to summarize that, but in the employers pack, the draft employers pack, I've just got a couple of pages of the headlines there, but that was really interesting. And that's informed the second phase of our campaign 
Uh, so we read it, we're, we're updating our digital campaign, we're doing some new ads, uh, carousel ads, um, and they, that will feature real people from each of the three um, council regions. Um, we're doing a, 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 what will hopefully be a lovely uh, short uh, filmed advert with interviews of people. We've got the employees pack that want to listen to you know, what your thoughts are on that and a word of mouth leaflet. Um, it's a tool for you to be able to use with your teams. Um, and then we're updating our landing page as well, which is at beproudtocare.co.uk um, with a brochure, which is really about helping people explore what the options are and kind of try and figure out what the right route is for them. Um, so what I just was interested in today is your feedback on the leaflet. Hopefully you've seen that the employers pack um, and we'd like your help with tracking outcomes this time. So what we are proposing to do is to interview a few people from at the beginning and the end of the campaign to kind of work out what your what, how effective it's been. So and any advice you have on how to make this land land well with people like you. Um, and what you might like to see in future campaigns. So it's really important that it's something that's meeting your needs. Um, so I want to stop sharing and start listening. How is that? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, whistle stop at all. No, that's absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. So really today we've heard about apprentices and how we can recruit. We've heard about how we can Proud to care of supporting our recruitment campaign. And then once you've got the staff, we, you know, you learn how you can sort of help your training budget through using the WDF. So thank you for that. And now I'm going to hand you over to Izzy from, um, she's actually from Alive, but she's actually going to be talking to us about the dementia, Bristol Dementia Hit program. So Izzy, are you there? I am. Karen. 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 Sorry. Richard, Richard's got his hand up, sorry. Yeah, just, just before you leave the proud to care bit, I mean, it is quite a significant document. I mean, just the, Kirsty referred to the employers pack and an information pack that's going around that went to all the Care and Support West directors uh, last week. Now, it may be that people in this forum haven't actually seen that, mm. but it will have gone out to all the membership and will be going out on a mailing list fairly soon. Mm. So well, Kirsty was looking for a bit of feedback today. I think that may come a bit later when it trickles down through the system. Okay, so um, it, rather than leaving Kirsty hanging there, there's a lot of work gone into that employer's pack. What it'll, be, it'll be coming out to all providers in the next month, and it will um, show people, it will assist with those of us who are using our own workforces to attract new recruits. Okay. And it will give more information to those people. It will show them the website that's gone on, the social media campaign, and everything else. So it is a significant piece. I'm sorry you haven't, it sounds like a lot of people haven't seen it yet. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Richard Deverson. I work for Windmill Care. I'm the provider, and I've been on this working group with Kirsty, um, guiding it. And so the employers pack is the result of that. So we've, it is relevant, and I hopefully it will be useful to us all as we. And my contact details and are at the end of the yeah. presentation, which will be shared with you. But there are two documents specifically. It would be fantastic to have your feedback on over mm -hmm. the next kind of week to 10 days, if possible. I mean, they're very visual documents, but hopefully you can um, just have a look and say, you know, what you would add, what's okay. useful, what's not useful. That would be really helpful. Thank you. Well, um, Karen Support West will actually get out to everybody. So we'll make sure. And then this programme will actually be put onto our website as well. So um, thank you. Thank you for your if time. You, if you'd like to let me have your slides, that'd be great. I can then yep. make sure. OK, right. Thank you very much, everybody. Izzy, <laughs> over That's to fine. you. Yeah, thank you. Um, Kirsty, as someone who used to work in marketing, I know what an impressive document, I know what amount of effort goes into doing that. So that's brilliant. Um, yeah, for those of you who um, don't know me, um, my name's Isabel Jones. I'm the CEO of the charity Alive, but I'm also one of the co-directors um, on the Bristol Dementia Hit, um, which is what I'm here to talk about um, today. So just bear with me while I just bring up my slides. There we go. Um, so I just I'll sort of be as quick as I can, because um, I know sort of where we are coming up for time. So I'll just talk quickly through what the Dementia Hit is. We're part of Bristol Health Partners, which is a strategic um, collaboration between university, major health and care providers and commissioners. And it covers the whole of Bristol, North Somerset and South Gloss. Um, it's all about commissioning, bringing people together um, and it's, it's not just focused on illness, but actually what they're trying to do is to prevent illness in the first place. So it's, it's a kind of really collaborative um, organisation. As part of the health partners, there sits about 15 different organisations called HITS, which are health integration teams. 
And these are a group of professionals who we're all working together to basically develop services. Um, we're on the dementia um, hit. Um, and within that, we've got direct co-directors. And then we also work with people who are actually living with dementia. So it's through research integrating that we're actually really trying to improve the lives of older people. Um, and again, I said, you know, we work across all the different organisations to try and make a difference. Um, at the moment, um, we're doing this through um, dementia research. Um, we're addressing regional inequalities. We're trying to expand post-diagnostic services. We're developing a new dementia model of care within the NHS Ageing Well programme. Um, and we're also engaging with people um, living with dementia to improve the outcomes of our work. So as the hit, um, we've, um, sorry, my daughter's just called me, that's bad timing, isn't it? Um, sorry, apologies. Um, so as a, as a hit, we've been going for, um, I think a number of years, but in the last two years, we've had major changes. We've, um, the project manager has changed within the dementia hit and then we've had three new directors come on board so we've got gary christopher um dr gary christopher who was previously the university of bristol but is now the university of swansea um, and he works predominantly um, in the field of dementia and gerontology we've got, um rachel holland who is um a um practicing psychologist um with bristol dementia Wellbeing service so she's on the ground delivering every day um, and then there's me on the CEO of the Charity Alive. So it's a really good kind of three pronged element that we've got different areas together. And it's the first time we've got the voluntary sector who are delivering um, dementia support um, on a day to day basis, working with research um, and provision. We've also had a coordinate a coordinator change, but she sits with Alive. Um, and then we've had a strategy refresh. So the, as I said, we've got five main areas of work that we're dealing with. We've got a research work stream and they meet regularly and that's led by Professor Rick Chesterton from um, UE. He will look for different areas of research that they want to work in and will bring up um, interesting um, research around the country. So if anyone wants to be involved in that, let me know there are regular research um, meetings. But also, if there is an area that you would like to see research happen within care homes, because at the moment, a lot of the research that we've seen um, is in the community. Um, and it's an area in terms of research that we'd like to see happen. So if anyone has an idea or would like to be as a care home, be involved in research, please let me know and I can put you in contact with Rick and I'll put my contact details um, in the chat at the end of it. Um, another area of work we're looking at is post-diagnostic support in the community. Um, we're developing meeting centres, um, Alive are launching those. Um, they are um, a way of supporting people in the community with dementia um, with support right from diagnosis. So it's three days a week, um, so it's very different to Memory Cafe and it's run by professionals. We're looking at how to address inequality um, in dementia, particularly in the area um, of um, the, within the BME communities. We work, we've got a um, support for the BME Dementia Steering Group um, and that's um, chaired by Rosa from um, the Chinese Community Wellbeing Service supported by Anne Dolores from Bristol Black Carers and we work really closely with them to really try and improve um, the outcomes um, in particular for the BME community. We've been asked this year from September last year to look at to be involved in the development of a new dementia model of care. So we're working with commissioners, um, with the Ageing Well um, Board to look at what needs to be changed and how that needs to be changed because at the moment dementia sits under the aging well um, but we're looking to see how that might change so there are there are going to be um, changes over the next next year but we're not quite sure what those will be um, at the moment but it's interesting that we can be involved and we were asked to be involved um, and the advantage of that is that we've as I come on we're and um, our Fifth point um, is about engaging people with living with dementia. In terms of working with commissioners in dementia model of care, we have fought very strongly to have the voice of people living with dementia in those decisions, because there is no point in coming up with a new model of care if it doesn't suit and it isn't what people need and what people want. Um, so how do we do it and how can you be involved? Well, there's lots, we've you know, got lots of different types of meetings and lots of networking. We have quarterly meetings, which are open to absolutely anyone involved um, in dementia. Um, within those meetings, we'll update on our work streams. We have visiting speakers. We'll also have updates um, from um, the ICPs, the ICBs and commissioners. So they're quite a vital and it's a place where you really can have your voice heard um, and speak openly. And we really want those to be a place where people can come and speak and listen. Um, 
what we'll do is I can send out dates um, after this so you've got them all written down if you're interested. The other um, group that I really want you all to, and to kind of share about is the provider meetings. So that's open to any provider, whether you're a care home provider, dementia care, you know, whether you're um, um, some people from the university, from the hospital come, from the university, um, Age UK come. So it, it's a variety of providers and it's a great way of um, networking, um, getting a bit of a support, getting a bit of advice, finding out what else is going on and how people can link up and how we can partnership. Um, they're quarterly on Zoom. The next one's going to be September. And again, I'll send the dates out. We'll then have one in January and then April. We're looking for face to face. But we know that people are busy, but we also know how important these kind of things are for sharing and supporting each other. Also, I just wanted to talk about quickly um, how th there are some other things that you, you might want to be involved with. There was some um, a programme recently called The Ageing Well. Um, and within that, lots of different um, moves have come on board in terms of um, improving the outcomes for older people in the Aging Well programme. We will manage to secure some money for the dementia area of this. So the areas that you'd probably be quite interested in, the dementia support in care homes um, and the training um, and co-production, um, which I'll go on to both of those um, in a minute. Um, so we're able to find a little bit of money to support the BME community, which is fantastic, and then also to support dementia meeting centres, because we're always trying to do innovative um, and interesting things. So in terms of care homes, things that you can be, and these are all free and accessible. So we've got the opportunity of doing activity audits. Um, and these are where a member of um, a live staff will come and observe an activity, find out what's going on, have a look at tips, have a look at kind of where things are going well, but also what can be improved. So there are two levels of observation and then they're linked to, um, um, to the CQC to close and then a report is produced on that. We've got five spaces left on that one. Um, the homes that have done it already, they've identified where their training needs are, so that will fit into what um, to what we were talking about before in terms of workforce development, but this is free so it can actually pinpoint and actually it's a really good way also post COVID of celebrating what's done what what's gone on well, but also where your staff need help and support and encouragement. Um, we also run active care. These are monthly Zoom supports for um, activity coordin coordinators and also care staff. We're looking to bring face to face towards the end of the year, but at the moment they're still the last Wednesday of the month. And again, these are free. It's a brilliant way of bringing um, care staff together to be able to support, to give them ideas, to share things. And you know, there's no point reinventing the wheel. And it, 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 again, it's been uh, people have found really good peer support within that. Um, we're also embedding three um, across three care homes across three areas. We're embedding an OT and an OT assistant to trial and test um, to see if an OT will help to reduce falls, improving activity and engagement. Um, those three homes have been identified, but what we're doing is we're actually hopefully evidencing um, this to the um, to the NHS, and there may be future funding going forward in a year. Um, to actually embed more OTs and OT assistants um, on a wider scale within care homes. The other two pro um, projects are the Wishing Washing Line um, and One Good Turn. The Wishing Washing Line West comes out of a project that Alive did actually um, a few years ago called Making Pals. This is a lovely, easy project to be involved with, um, and it's all about um, giving our older people the wishes that they want. So post COVID, it's been really hard to really engage, I think sometimes in sort of the difficulties we've had, but actually what we're doing is we're supporting care homes to run co-production co sessions with their residents to find out what they'd really like to do. Previously, we put someone up in a plane because they'd never been able to, they wanted to fly. They're, someone else was arrested. She was 104 and she'd always wanted to be arrested and always been good and she felt like being naughty. Um, so we were able to put her, we got the police involved, it was absolutely brilliant. Other people have had a ride in a Downton Abbey car. We've had Hells Angels to a care home. Um, it's about finding what people would like to do and actually really supporting them. And other people have had really simple wishes, like they wanted a cup of tea with a brand new neighbour or they wanted to play a game of cards. So they don't have to be complicated wishes. But with us, we can help and support you in doing that. Um, and again, it's a really easy, lovely thing to demonstrate to your residents and to your staff. Um, so again, I'll put my contact details, get in contact if you want to be involved. The one good turn, um, we've managed to deliver intergenerational linking work over um, COVID, bizarrely enough. We, it was incredible. We actually found that more families were involved in volunteering. So we've been able to carry this on through the um, 
through the funding from the NHS. It's a lovely co-production social action project. So what we're doing is we're asking older people how they would like to change the community around them, what they would like to see. Some care homes, some older people actually wanted to put hampers together to take to local food banks and they did it. They went out and they bought the hampers, they bought the things and that actually they put them together and then the children took them to the, to the, um, to the, uh, to the food banks for them. We've had things where we, um, younger children have gone out and done the walks for older people where they wanted to but couldn't go out because of COVID. So it's a lovely intergenerational project that again we've got the support, we've got the need, we've got we know the schools. So again if you want to bring children back in um, but even if COVID hits we have ways of being able to link up without bringing them in physically. So don't let that be a barrier because we've actually, we've done it for the last two years and it's been really successful. We've had Zoom meetings, we've had um, music exchanges, art exchanges. So there are ways of doing that, um, even though, um, you know, COVID has been a barrier. So that's kind of a bit of a summary, whistle stop tour of what we're up to at the moment. Um, I will um, um, put these two contact details on our phone number um, within the chat. Um, Louise is, um, also works for um, the Dementia Hit, um, so anything, um, please send that along and we'll put you in contact with the right person with the live or um, within the Dementia Hit. So and if you want to be involved in the research as well, let me know. So thank you very much and I hope you continue to enjoy the good weather and I hope all your residents aren't too hot and bothered. <laughs> thank you, Isabel. That was absolutely amazing. And what fantastic work is being done in the age of dementia this is fantastic to hear and i'm sure everybody's going to take away something from that so thank you very much does anybody have any questions for isabel or any anybody who's um because everybody's still on online so if anybody has any questions we are a little bit over time but uh, um i see as he's put her uh, details in as has richard so if anybody wishes to contact either of them please please do so because there are some fantastic opportunities here for adult social care and um i'm sorry that it's been such a whizzy sort of um meeting but some really good stuff and and i know you know our presenters could talk for a lot lot longer there's a lot more information to be had so please do contact people and please make use of the information and opportunities that are there available for everybody um, I'm going to stop recording now, as I remembered.